I'm Afshin Rattansi. You're watching Going Underground, broadcasting from our studios in central London. Coming up in the show... We speak to a member of the UK Parliamentary Committee investigating evidence against David Cameron and his government on mass slaughter in the Arabian Peninsula. And as former London Mayor Ken Livingstone looks set to catalyse Labour's rejection of nuclear weapons, we speak to the former mayor of Hiroshima about the legacy of US genocide in Japan. Plus, slavery in modern-day Britain is Theresa May covering up a slavery inquiry into the circumstances of nearly 20,000 whose visas are sponsored by subjects of Saudi Arabia in the United Arab Emirates. All this and more in today's Going Underground. There was an interesting connection between the two British artists whose deaths made headlines around the world last week, but you wouldn't have noticed if you were following mainstream media that broadly ignores the plight of Palestinians that is a key grievance used by ISIS and al-Qaeda to recruit militants. David Bowie's musical Lazarus finishes its extended run on Wednesday, and it's been playing in a New York theatre that refused a play directed by Alan Rickman, the Harry Potter star who died at the same age in the same week as Bowie. The play... My name is Rachel Corey. We are all born, and someday we'll all die. Most likely to some degree alone. What if our aloneness isn't a tragedy? What if our aloneness allows us to speak the truth without being afraid? The words of the activist Rachel Corrie, edited by Alan Rickman. Corrie was a member of the International Solidarity Movement who travelled to the Gaza Strip during the Second Intifada. This is what happened to her. This Israeli military video shows the moments after Rachel Corey's death. The American activist killed by an army bulldozer in Gaza in 2003, protesting Israel's policies here. These photos show Rachel Corey on the day she was killed. Now, nine years after her death, an Israeli court has ruled it an accident. Few of those who supported Corey thought it was an accident. When criticized about his play, Alan Rickman responded by talking about the purpose of theater. What's the point of theatre if it isn't to stir up that kind of debate? I mean, that's not the only point, but it's uh, a point that's being lost uh, in recent years. And ahead of tomorrow's Human Rights Watch report on businesses aiding Israel's occupation of Palestine, here are the words of Rachel Corey when she was around 10 years old, before Alan Rickman's play featuring her posthumous words was effectively banned in the United States. I'm here for other children. I'm here because I care. I'm here because children everywhere are suffering and because 40,000 people die each day from hunger. I'm here because those people are mostly children. We have got to understand that the poor are all around us and we're ignoring them. We have got to understand that these deaths are preventable. We have got to understand that people in third world countries think and care and smile and cry just like us. We have got to understand that they are us. We are them. My dream is to stop hunger by the year 2000. My dream is to give the poor a chance. My dream is to save the 40,000 people who die each day. My dream can and will come true if we all look into the future and see the light that shines there. The carnage in Yemen continues as for UN brokered peace talks that were meant to happen last week. They've been postponed. The UN says the entire country faces humanitarian disaster. Ten million face the prospect of famine and thousands have been killed in a UK-backed Saudi war on the Arabian Peninsula where Al-Qaeda and ISIS have now emerged. Britain's Foreign Secretary says the UK has been helping in Saudi targeting of airstrikes. Parliament's International Development Select Committee is reviewing Britain's role in Yemen and Dr Lisa Cameron of the SNP is on on that committee and joins me now. Uh, thanks, Lisa, for coming on the show. So, uh, Foreign Secretary Hammond already admitting Britain is uh, aiding Saudi Arabia identify targeting of airstrikes, presumably not MSF hospitals. What can your committee do? Um, well, the committee have actually re-established um, a subcommittee looking at armed export controls to address this issue. It's a very important issue and particularly the SNP, my own party, oppose any arms sales that may be used um, in, in bombing of civilians and, and creating humanitarian terror um, in Yemen or anywhere else in the world. Any uh, truth to the reports we saw in the press from the campaign against the arms trade? Uh, I mean, they said... Uh, Yemen looks in five months, but Syria does in five years. They said the government is on notice for being in breach of international law. Is that one of the things your committee will be looking into? Um, the committee will um, be looking at the situation and monitoring the UK's role within that situation. Um, so that's something that will be addressed. 
So what is the point of the International Development uh, Department doing something about trying to alleviate the uh, humanitarian disaster if the other branches of government, the, the Foreign Office and the Ministry of Defense, are actively involved in backing Saudi Arabia, which is bombing Yemen? Well, we have to hold the UK government to account in terms of any involvement that has been had, and that's um, something that the committee will be scrutinising. But we would urge um, the um, Department for International Development to look very closely at the situation in Yemen, the humanitarian crisis, and do all that they can on the ground in terms of supporting um, you know, civic society and organisations on the ground that are working with women, children, um, and uh, you know, all others who are, are very vulnerable and being being tremendously affected by this crisis, this deep humanitarian crisis, has children in poverty and starving and hospitals um, under attack. It's, it's significant. I mean, given that uh, even after those mass beheadings by the Saudi Arabian government, David Cameron saying he was only disappointed, the Saudi was a good, uh, good ally of Britain, can you really expect, uh, whatever the International Development uh, Department says, for Britain to stop helping Saudi Arabia target these airstrikes on one of the poorest countries in, in the world? I think it's extremely important um, and our party will be continuing to urge um, the UK government and, and David Cameron to ensure um, that UK arms sales um, are not involved in um, any bombing of civilians in, in Yemen or anywhere else. Um, that, that would be potentially in, in breach um, of humanitarian laws and, and that's something uh, that the SNP directly opposed. You don't think they'll just say, well, we, that's a matter for the Foreign Office and the Ministry of Defence? I mean, they, I mean, do they even know? Do you think the International Development Committee, which you, International Development Department, which you scrutinise, do you think they know what the Foreign Office and Ministry of Defence are doing in that well, area? I think we have to have a joint up approach, joined up approach right across government. Um, David Cameron has just signed um, the Sustainable Development Goals um, commitment um, to ensure that no one's left behind, to ensure that we eradicate extreme poverty, to ensure that children can go to school um, and have their health needs uh, met, and that countries are able to be sustainable. Um, so this um, has to be examined and, and it is a matter of interest for the International Development Committee too because we're not going to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals if we leave countries like Yemen behind. Well, it's not a matter of whether we're leaving them behind. Are we actually creating the humanitarian disaster? Philip Hammond in 2014 said we should be uh, clear the use of violence to make political gains in Yemen is completely unacceptable. And yet at the same time, he's just recently said we're helping the Saudis target the bombs, I mean, hopefully not the ones in that picture of uh, the Médecins Sans Frontières hospital being destroyed. Mm. Well, we know that the hospital was destroyed. We know that that has um, caused death and it has caused um, casualties, um, women, children and, 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 you know, extremely vulnerable people who were in need of medical aid. And these types of things must be condemned and the SNP will continue to do so. And they will continue to try to hold the UK government to account at every turn in terms of this type of issue. Thanks to the airstrikes, thanks to the instability, ISIS, Daesh and uh, Al-Qaeda moving into towns in Yemen. Do you think it'll take an atrocity on streets in Scotland, streets in uh, England or Wales for the government to review this policy, not your committee? Um, well, obviously, we want to do everything um, that we can to prevent anything happening in terms of um, terrorist strikes in the UK. That that's, has to be um, forefront in terms of all policy. Um, but in terms of uh, the situation in Yemen, it does not help to stabilise the situation in the Middle East. In fact, um, I would argue that it helps to destabilise things further. And that's not what we need, and that's why the situation has to be addressed. You keep talking about arms sales. Do you think you could be your committee could be overtaken by events, given this deadline of 14 days the government has to respond, uh, respond regarding uh, the possibility that it is uh, breaking the law, breaking international law in supplying weapons uh, to kill civilians? Um, well, I think it is very important that the UK government um, answer um, whichever questions they have to answer within the deadline. But I think it's also important that there's a longer term scrutiny of um, what has taken place. And our committee are involved in um, aspects of that, as has been discussed. And I'm sure that um, other committees will be too. Because there'll be dangers, won't there, of having some committee members that may uh, be close to the uh, Saudi government or close to British-Saudi relations and so on? 
Um, I would expect that members of the, the committee will act with um, integrity in terms of the conduct of the committee and certainly having worked um, closely within the International Development Committee since being elected in May last year. Um, the, the people that I have been working with have in, in all sorts of areas including the, the reports we've produced in the Syrian refugee crisis um, and now in terms of the Ebola report um, it, you know, which um, will be released soon. And when the Prime Minister and Cabinet Minister say you're endangering uh, arms sales too, uh, that are responsible for uh, jobs in this country, regardless of the human catastrophe in Yemen? Um, well, I think that, you know, we, ha we have to make sure that we abide by humanitarian um, laws, international laws. Um, jobs also have to be created, but surely that can't be at the expense of people's lives. Your International Development Subcommittee may be interested in this. Why not more media reporting about uh, such a crisis in the heart of the Middle East? Yes, I mean, I think it has to be something that's taken account of by the media. The media has to take this on board, and indeed, that's why I felt it was extremely important to come to speak about the situation today. It's certainly something that has been raised in Parliament and will be um, more so um, in months to come, um, but it's something that has to be covered in the media. And you're, of course, as you said, in the SNP. I've got to ask one yes. question. For the first time since the Act of Union 1707, maybe, uh, you were in Parliament, the Housing Bill, you weren't allowed, as a uh, Scottish Member of Parliament, to vote in Parliament. Yes, indeed. Um, what did that feel like? Yes, I mean, the people in Scotland are watching that very closely. Um, there's been a lot of feedback in terms of thinking that we now have a second class of citizen in terms of MPs at Westminster. I think the UK government should have been acting in um, a more professional manner in terms of setting up an English parliament, if that's the way they wish to proceed, rather than trying to utilise the UK parliament. Um, no protest. As that. No protest from your massive uh, uh, new round of... Um a contingent of MPs elected in May, you all just, speaker told you you're not allowed to vote and you all just quietly went to one well, side. Well, I think you'll find that uh, my colleague Pete Wishart um, gave an extremely interesting and uh, strong uh, speech at the time and it will be something that we will continue to take forward and people of Scotland are watching it very closely as I said. Dr Lisa Cameron, thank you. Thank you. After the break. As Labour's defence review looks set to oppose Trident in June, the former mayor of Hiroshima tells us why he's backing Ken Livingston and Jeremy Corbyn, whatever North Korea does. And is the threat of an ISIS atrocity on UK streets linked to Theresa May's treatment of slaves in modern-day Britain? All this and more coming up in part two of Going Underground. The former mayor of Hiroshima was one of the stars at yesterday's Genocide Memorial Day in London. U.S. nuclear bombs destroyed the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki to rubble in August 1945. Today, more than 70 years after the war, thousands still suffer the devastating aftereffects of radiation and unfathomable emotional pain. Britain's Labour Party, led by Jeremy Corbyn, looks set to oppose nuclear proliferation in Scotland, whilst the government, along with mainstream media, supports the upgrade of the Triton nuclear weapons system. Hiroshima's former mayor, Dr. Tadatoshi Akiba, is now president of Mayors for Peace, and he joins me now. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. There was a big anniversary, war anniversary year in 2015. School textbooks here still say OK, nuclear weapons are bad, but uh, actually they can do good, as they did in Hiroshima and Nagasaki to end the Second World War. What's your take on that? Right. There were two uh, very important events during World War II. And one was the Holocaust experience, of course. And the other one was the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings by nuclear weapons. And uh, however, I believe that there is a big difference uh, you know, between the two the world's understanding of the Holocaust has reached a level where any politician anywhere in the world you know, saying, well, we need the Nazi-type concentration camp for national security. Okay? Uh, any politician saying that would be ousted instantly. But in the case of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, any politician claiming that we need nuclear weapons for our country for national security would be quite often cheered and would become a hero. That difference, I guess, stems partly from the lack of understanding of how terrible the bombs were um, and uh, you know, how seriously the victims and survivors of the, of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombing, uh, we call them hibakusha. Hibakusha's voices you know, have not been ignored 
by the media, by the leaders in the world, and so forth. And their message as well, which is, can be summarized as, no one else should ever suffer as we did. Well, why do you think there is that disparity between the Holocaust and, and American uh, nuclear bombing? Well, it's the power structure. The, um, there are nine nuclear weapon states, and in total, they possess 16,000 nuclear warheads. And it is a gigantic business enterprise, and also, you know, it has created a huge societal, political, economic, cultural sort of system on which many people depend, and very few are willing to, you know, shake the foundation of that. I understand you met uh, Ken Livingston when he was uh, mayor of London, London and you were, yes, you were yes. mayor of Hiroshima. He's now leading Jeremy Corbyn's defense review. Mm -hmm. Voices on uh, Labour's side, they're called Red Tories, some of them, let alone the government, say, but look at North Korea. If we had the nuclear weapons, uh, we would be able to fight off the threat from North Korea. Is it nonsense? Yeah, it's nonsense. How, you know, how, how would you fight North Korea with a nuclear weapon? I mean. You know, people are emphasizing North Korea too much. You know, North Korea cannot u use its nuclear weapon against Japan or China or Korea. All nine nuclear weapon states possess 16,000 nuclear warheads. And they are bound by Article 6 of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty to negotiate in good faith toward nuclear disarmament and as well as to create a treaty that would ban nuclear weapons under effective and international law you know, within a short time. But they haven't done anything. And as a matter of fact, the Republic of Marshall Islands, you know, where the United States conducted uh, nuclear tests over, well, just about 10 years and uh, created basically a hell in the South, beautiful South Pacific. This country is bringing the um, lawsuit against nine nuclear weapon states at the International Court of Justice. That's another you know, hopeful sign. So, uh, as you say, Article 6 doesn't seem to be abided by many states. Military people oppose um, the upgrade of Trident here on the basis of strategic concerns, not the moral mm -hmm. concerns. Why is it that uh, you can call uh, the American involvement in Japan genocide? in this way. And of course, we must also admit, I mean, NATO states like Turkey don't recognize the Armenian genocide. Yeah. Why, why are you using the word genocide here? Well, genocide is um, sort of, you know, a massacre of many people within a short period of time. And over history, there have been many, many genocides. And uh, again, you know, what, what you call genocide is often determined not by uh, necessarily the people who suffered, but by those people who write history. You know, that means that those who possess power. And in doing so, they pick and choose the genocides they like, and they drop the genocides they don't like. So what we learn in history as genocides are you know, skewed. The entire media mm -hmm. here, when Jeremy Corbyn, the newly elected leader of the Labour Party, the opposition party, has said he would not press the nuclear button, suggested that he wasn't fit to be a politician because he couldn't right. press the button. Having a nuclear button, nuclear button should be a shame for that country, for the mentality, for the intelligence, for the morality of the country that, that actually possesses it. So nine nuclear weapon states should be categorized as the country who you know, clearly lack moral leadership and also the, 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 the insight that would help to you know, create the future. But uh, the world is upside down. The military you know, type of thinking that we have these weapons, we have to rely on them type of thinking has pervaded the society so long. The, the world has evolved less violently over centuries. Now, for example, Steven Pinker at Harvard University cataloged in an 800-page book that practically across the board, human beings have evolved more peacefully, less violently, including war, domestic violence, you know, work violence, and everything else. And that's because we have made such an effort. We have so abandoned the status quo thinking of something which would promote violence. So saying that, okay, you know, uh, pushing a button is a manly sort of act, it's a courageous act. That kind of thinking should be attacked and say that no, the existence of the button itself 
is contrary to human values and what the human beings you know, made ourselves to be over, over the years. Dr. Tadaroshi Akiba, thank you. Thank you. Lords and ladies debating the immigration bill today may not have time to look at a disturbing report on slavery in Britain sneaked out just before Christmas. It concerns Theresa May's domestic worker visa scheme introduced back in 2012. The inquiry by barrister James Ewins found that domestic workers such as cleaners, chauffeurs or cooks that arrive in the UK with their employee have no reasonable levels of protection. Nearly half of visas are issued to families from Persian Gulf autocracies like Saudi Arabia and the UAE. With me is the director of anti-slavery international Aidan McQuaid. Aidan, thanks for coming back on the show. We know David Cameron only expresses disappointment when there are beheadings, crucifixions. I mean, do you really expect uh, him to do anything about Saudi slavery in Britain? Well, uh, David Cameron, amongst others, has declared that Britain is going to be a world leader against slavery. So it would be something at odds with that particular ambition if they carry on permitting slavery to exist within this country not only for it to exist, but actually for it to be facilitated by the visa system, which the Home Office has brought into, into place for domestic workers. Tell me about this uh, inquiry uh, and, this, and this report, as I say, sneaked out. Uh, so according to some uh, MPs, it, it received no parliamentary scrutiny. Yeah, it was um, at the end of the last parliament, whenever they were discussing the Modern Slavery Act, there was uh, a move in the House of Lords to give domestic workers the right to change employers. The government opposed this and in turn promised there would be a further review of the situation of domestic workers. So this is the review which is carried out by James Ewens. And this is the third, the fourth review because um, two committees run by Frank Field in relation to the Modern Slavery Act and a further review by the Human Rights Committee of Westminster all recommended giving domestic workers the right to change employers. James Ewens has concluded this as well, as well as some other measures in order to protect domestic workers. Now, whenever the government instituted this review, um, Karen Bradley, who is the minister, said that it would be her hope at that the recommendations of this review would be implemented. So the review is out. We're waiting for the government to implement the recommendations. In fairness uh, to, the, to the government, if anyone of those nearly 20,000 domestic workers in Britain are watching this program, the Home Office is saying domestic workers simply apply through the national referral mechanism if they are actually slaves. I mean, the government's been saying this ad infinitum for a number of years, and James Ewan's taken that on board whenever he's done his review and still found that the level of protection for domestic workers is inadequate. That's going on in a time whenever they're cutting the policing as well. So the police have never investigated domestic work uh, abuses up until now, don't have much of a culture for it, don't have much of experience in it, and now you're having less and less cops in the streets in order to be able to deal with that and all the other issues of crime and security which they have to deal with. The truth of the matter is the UK needs domestic workers. There's not enough people to fill the sort of legitimate, decent work in these, uh, for these jobs and these roles um, that, uh, that, that there's the demand for. And so the government actually, if it was to regularise their position, give them proper protection as workers, they could then start actually earning tax from them as well. So it's a very peculiar way, re response, very peculiar level of thinking that the government has in relation to domestic workers here, which frankly is at odds with both national interest in terms of taxation and frankly at odds in terms of national aspiration in terms of being a world leader against slavery. Given so many of the domestic workers are for Saudi families uh, based in Britain, mm. do you think that has any impact? I mean, we know that the uh, biggest corruption inquiry ever in this country was thrown out by the serious fraud office when Labour were in power because and the prostitution, sex workers were involved in that one because Saudi Arabia said, we're going to withdraw intelligence cooperation. There could be terror attacks on, London, on British streets. Yeah, there's all sorts of nasty, nasty uh, blackmail which goes on in relation to this. Um, however, um, if the UK wishes to, uh, wishes to obtain its aspiration in relation to slavery, it needs to act on this. And frankly, also, we should look directly at Saudi Arabia, which is promoting systems of jurisprudence right throughout the Gulf, which is not only tolerant of slavery, but actually promoting it. To which Saudi Arabia would say it's none of uh, Britain's business to uh, talk about their jurisprudence system. But one would hope in Britain, I mean, these are domestic it, visa laws here. Do you really think the Saudi Arabian government is possibly, that's the only explanation for, the, as you're describing it, the strange response to uh, 
slavery in Britain. I, I'm sure the government is being lobbied on this. I don't have any evidence, but I would imagine that they're being lobbied. This is what goes on all the time. Um, we lobby the government to change one thing. I'm sure there's others who are lobbying the government to keep it in one place. Um, but the fundamental thing is, if the British government wishes to be a world leader on this, it needs to um, put its own house in order first, and it has not yet done this. So if a slave is watching this, uh, working in Britain, and they've maybe been abused today, what are they supposed to do? It, it's a very perilous situation that they're in, because if they do flee employment, and they're then running an enormous risk of getting deported. Now, the government says apply to the national referral mechanism. And there are some moves to reform the national referral mechanism. But when we were looking at it in 2013, we found an interesting statistic, which was that less than 20% of non-EU nationals who apply to the national referral mechanism are recognized as victims of slavery. More than 80% of EU nationals who apply to the national referral me mechanism are recognized as victims of slavery. So if you're talking about domestic workers who are coming from outside the European Union, there is considerable risk that they will simply not be recognized. But James Ewens again has looked at the thing in, in its totality and come up with a series of recommendations, fundamental of which is changing the rules of domestic workers' visas such that they can change employers. Let's be clear, we're talking about them as slaves exactly because of this visa situation, their bonded labor and that's the fear that they all have, that if you complain, you get deported back to... Wherever. And that the, the level of poverty that they've come from is such that, you know, even the small amount of money that they may be getting in their uh, brutalized situation is such that it can provide some hope for transformation for, um, for their children or for the rest of their families. But make no mistake, the current visas for overseas domestic workers issued by the Home Office are effectively a license for trafficking. And the government has to confront that. And the government has to change that. Aidan McQuaid, thank you. Thank you. We contacted the Home Office about the allegations made in that interview, and they told us that... This government is committed to stopping modern slavery in all its forms. As part of that, we commissioned a review of the overseas domestic worker visa route. We are grateful for James Ewan's work and are considering carefully his recommendations. A full response to his report will be announced in due course. That's it for today's show, but join us again on Wednesday as millionaire celebrities, bankers and world leaders gather in the Swiss ski resort of Davos. We look at how the 2016 World Economic Forum is looking to profit from poverty. Get in touch via social media. Watch RT UK News with Bill Dodd on the hour from 7 till 10. See you on Wednesday, 14 years to the day, the Pentagon released to the world photos of cuffed and blindfolded prisoners at Camp X-Ray in Guantanamo Bay. <laughs>